two videos from modern day philosopher Stefan Molyneux. Hello and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm your anchor, Heike Corser. Tonight's show speaks once again to the ideas of liberty in an attempt to help you better understand the basic principles. Stefan Molyneux is a modern day philosopher who claims to hold the largest ongoing philosophical conversation in the world. His radio show, Free Domain Radio, has been producing consistent content for more than five years. He lives with his wife and children in Canada. He is a frequent guest on many political talk shows on various cable networks. This first video is entitled, Sunset of the State. Once the Earth was thought to be the center of the universe, with the planets and stars and the sun revolving around it. As observations improved, though, weird complications began to mess up this model, particularly the orbit of Mars. As the Earth goes around the Sun, Mars sometimes appears to move backwards as we overtake it. In a vain attempt to solve this problem, horrendously complicated circles within circles were created, tangling up the mathematics in an increasing kaleidoscope of endless overcomplexity. A few brave thinkers, and brave they had to be in those days, tried putting the sun at the center of the solar system. Ah, then, everything fell into place at once. The crazy mess of the Ptolemaic system of circles within circles and equations piled upon equations evaporated in a moment. Only a few equations were now needed for perfect accuracy. The same simplicity and clarity and accuracy was revealed when navigators accepted that the world was round rather than flat, and when physicists accepted the Einsteinian argument that the speed of light is constant. Systems based on fundamental falsehoods always get more and more complicated as endless corrections and adjustments pile on in order to make them look more right. Every few generations these accumulated errors become so ridiculously complex that the entire system becomes unsustainable and kind of embarrassing. Even the non-expert grasps that something must be fundamentally wrong with the whole mess. And a few brave souls take out a blank sheet of paper, push aside all their prior preconceptions and start from scratch, based on reason and evidence rather than the accumulated errors of history. The central tenet of all systems of human morality is the non-aggression principle. We all learn it as children. Don't hit, don't push, don't hurt, don't steal. We learn that violence and bullying and threats are wrong, immoral, and only make whatever problem you're trying to solve worse. That's the rule we're taught when we're kids, and it's a good rule. Solid, logical, empirical. But then, when we get older, if we have the courage to see, we understand that this is not how adult society is run at all. In adult society, you have to pay a bunch of men and women your money, or they call on other men and women in blue costumes to come and take it. And if you try to defend yourself from this theft, they will shoot you. This is the reality of societies with governments. Your society. In statist societies, free exchanges between free adults that some people don't like can get you shot. If you get a job and try to avoid paying for a non-existent Ponzi retirement plan, you can be kidnapped and shot if you resist. If you break any of the hundreds of thousands of made-up rules about trade and barter, you get arrested. If you don't want to fund foreign dictators, you get arrested. If you don't want to pay for an evil war, you get 
arrested. And on, and on, and on, and on. When we were kids, our teachers said, don't use violence. But if, as adults, we don't pay a government teacher's salary, we get arrested. As we grow up, the more we look around, the more we see that every law is a gun. And guns are everywhere in the adult world. And that using violence to get what you want is the foundation of the society we live in. So, which is it? Is violence good or bad? Our statist system has become so ridiculously complicated because it has, like the Earth-centered model of the solar system, a fundamental error right down at the root of it. This error is the belief that violence is the best way to solve complex social problems. The delusion that if you point enough guns at enough people, run up enough debt using the unborn as your collateral, kidnap and enslave enough free souls, that the world will just get better and better and better. How's that working out for us? The tax code. Aggressions against free trade and personal consumption. The endless multiplying laws governing every aspect of our waking lives. These are like the circles within circles of the Earth-centered model of the solar system. The only end to that increasing complexity is total collapse. When you recognize that increasing complications reveal core errors at the root of a false system, you will see that the non-aggression principle needs to move to the center of our virtues, of our morals, of our society as a whole. Like the sun itself, it needs to be fixed at the center of everything we do. The non-aggression principle cannot orbit a primitive, violent hierarchy that we actually inherited from apes and cavemen. Think of it. A society without organized violence. Without the threat of state coercion, without institutional kidnapping and theft and imprisonment, without taxation and the thieving predation of state fiat currency counterfeiting. Does that make you dizzy? It should. When the sun was moved to the center of the solar system, where it actually is, it was disorienting to everyone at the time. Just as the time and space relativity of Einsteinian physics was disorienting, just as evolution is disorienting to many, and quantum physics messes with the head of anyone who really grasps it. In the face of ancient falsehoods, the truth is often dizzying and confusing and alien and freaky. When we place the non-aggression principle where it should be, at the center of morality and society, beliefs we have held for tens of thousands of years suddenly evaporate. The ancient era of the morally justified state crumbles into its component atoms of evil. The dizzying and multiplying complexity of law upon law, gun upon gun, murder upon murder, all this ugly mess is revealed as hysterical attempts to cover up the core crime of justified institutional violence. The myth of the social contract is revealed as a gun to the necks of the unborn. Laws are exposed as well-armed prejudices. Taxation is revealed as theft, lobbying, as bribery, arrest, as kidnapping, governments and armies as the most successful criminal gangs, and schools as violence-fueled indoctrination camps for helpless and dependent children. It is disorienting. It is confusing. It is frightening. It is dizzying. And it is true. The sunlight of reason and morality and truth is essential. It must be at the center of everything we do. Because in society, just as in the world, the sun
going up, or it is going down, perhaps to a night without another sunrise. Whether the dim light of our modern world is a sunset or a sunrise, that is up to you. For our discussion panel tonight, we have Johnny Ray and Allie Havens. How are you doing, Mr. Johnny Ray? Uh, very good, thank you, Heike. Um, I enjoyed the video, Allie. That was textbook Molyneux. I'm a big fan of Stefan Molyneux. Um, and he, you know, he, he likes to talk about uh, the non-aggression principle, universally acceptable behavior, and that's pretty much what he was doing here. Um, do you think that we're coming to a tipping point, like things are maybe really going to change, where people put away violence and move towards voluntary interaction? Do you think that really might be happening? You know, I, I want to say yes uh, really bad, <laughs> but at the same time, I'll acknowledge that most people feel like their, what happens within their lifetime is what's going to move society, or that's how, you know, that's what makes, that's what would give people a sense of importance in the world, and while I would love to see it happen in my lifetime, uh, I'm not so optimistic, but at the same time, I see us moving towards that. Just as he explained in his video, people move towards the logic. And it's always frustrating for those people that see the illogical functions of society continuing and building upon themselves and creating complications and all the um, possible deaths are just, you know, like he said, with the endorsement of government, there's lots of people that die. Uh, the government kills more people than any other organization in the world. Uh, the United States government, I think, now has killed more people than any other working organization uh, around right now. So uh, it's just a good example of how, how it's not just about being logically consistent, it's about the effects of not uh, working to your logic to try to figure out problems and solve problems. And I like how he points to the gun in the room. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I see it. And I tell you, it is frustrating. Um, I, um, um, Molyneux, um, the, um, yeah, I, logical consistency. That's kind of what, I, I'm a sort of a simple-minded person. And that's what all what kind of drew me towards libertarianism because I always because growing up I was sort of a, a conservative Republican I loved Rush mm -hmm. but you always I always had to kind of make excuses for things over here right. like taxes you know what we we have to have taxes to we we have to steal money from these people to pay for you know to keep them safe because they're not smart enough right but um, but then then. Uh, you know, with out of the other side of your mouth, I'm talking about freedom and how freedom is so great. Exactly. And uh, it just doesn't make any sense. Well, like you were saying, you know, you could you definitely couldn't claim that the libertarian that libertarianism attracts you know only simple-minded people. Not that I even would say that you're simple-minded. Just speaking for just myself. Just from what, yeah. for what you're saying, because uh, but it does. I mean, it there's no excuse. You can't say, oh, I'm not smart enough to understand the ideas or you know, I have other ideas, because it, it appeals to both types, people that are interested in politics, people that are just interested in truth in general, uh, are going to be attracted to these ideas, as well as people that just can't understand, like the video is talking about, all the complexities within society and what, and what they're all about, are going to look for a different answer. And I think that, uh, you know, the looking at this, if, if someone, stops blaming, you know, like you see with the Occupy movement, people want to blame this wealthy person or that wealthy person. If you focus your, uh, your energy on looking at what the state is doing and consider, and looking at it like 
not with this view that you're going to try to justify certain actions because you like some of the things they do. If you just look at them as an organization or even just a company uh, without bias, then it's no question. They're the, they are nothing that anyone would support if they were just, you know, some company that was saying, oh, I'm going to, you know, start all these charitable organizations, I'm going to take care of poor people, I'm going to send kids to school. People wouldn't listen to an organization like that that was also killing and murdering and stealing from people. It wouldn't work in a free society. Yeah. Um, you know, when I, when I get into conversations with people about, about freedom and stuff, I, I kind of run out of gas because it's just the, the violence and the aggression. That I, 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 say, I, I start there and I end there, and, mm -hmm. I, and I, I, I don't get why <sighs> Why? Why it's so hard to reach people yes. about those things. Yeah, and you know, I think that the reason is because people are more comfortable with believing the things that they've been told or the things that the people around them think or the things they hear on the, on the TV that are, um, they try to appeal to your logic in a way, but they leave a lot of stuff out. If, for instance, if they say, oh, we need to, um, like the whole debate about the budget and everything and, you know, the wide-ranging views, you know, Republicans saying, oh, we need to balance the budget, but then not proposing any serious reforms. And then the Democrat, Democrats saying, oh, if we spend less money, then that means all the poor people are going to be, you know, dying in the streets. And there's a lot, a uh, lot left to be desired within those things, and it's not really hitting the root of the problem, which is the dependency that we have on uh, that a lot of people have uh, on the government, dependency they have for the government to take care of them, is a problem the government created in itself. It's not a problem of capitalism or uh, freedom didn't create these problems. The government created these problems. Yeah, yeah. So don't try to use the government to solve the problem because, as Molyneux said, it's just going to create more complexities. Yep, and um, like, what did you think about when he was sort of pointing out the hypocrisy of adults and say, telling their children basic principles of uh, non-aggression? Don't start fights. i you know, if there is a fight at school, they'd always want to know who started it, and we don't apply those same things to adults. I think when that segment was running, I was trying to think of questions to ask. So, as you mention it now. Um, I, 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 you know, I think we can talk about, I think we have another Molyneux video. Uh, Heike? Thanks so much, Tony and Allie. This next video is called, The Money That Is Sold Abroad Is You. The State of the Union is not good. Our trade deficit is too large. We must not go back to unwise spending. This is America. George Orwell once wrote that the great enemy of clear language is insincerity. When there is a gap between one's real and one's declared aims, one turns, as it were, instinctively to long words and exhausted idioms like a cuttlefish spurting out ink. You've probably heard confusing phrases like the trade deficit, the falling dollar, the national debt, unfunded liabilities, and so on which all sound vague and actuarial and vaguely, well, not me. The reality behind these accounting phrases is perfectly monstrous. When someone, a foreigner say, loans money to the American government, what are they getting in return? Well, they are getting promises of interest payments and eventual repayment of the principal. Where does your government get this money. The government is not a business, it does not generate profits in the free market. So where does it get the money to repay its creditors? Are you beginning to understand that it is not 
dollars that are being sold, or bonds, or agency debt, or treasuries, or anything like that. Where is your government going to get the money to pay off its creditors? It's not pieces of paper, or contracts, or computer bits that are being sold. There is only one thing that the government has to sell. Governments have only one asset that they can use as collateral. Your leaders are selling you. When China lends $800 billion to your government, what they get in return is a guarantee that $10,000 plus interest will be taken from your family at gunpoint and shipped overseas. When a farmer gets a loan from a bank, he uses his livestock as collateral. It is the milk and meat his cows will produce in the future that he will use to pay off his loan. The bank is buying a share in his cows. You are the livestock that your leaders use as collateral. The leaders that you cheer for and throw parades for and drop balloons behind and donate money to are selling you to Chinese rulers to the Japanese, to the Nigerians, to South American drug lords with accounts in the Caribbean banking centers, to Russia, to Korea, to Egypt, to Colombia, to Chile, to the Philippines, to Malaysia, and anyone else who is willing to give them a few dollars in return for the blood, sweat, and toil of your future. The flag that you praise and the anthems that you sing and the rulers that you weep and kneel before have as much loyalty to you as a plantation owner had to his slaves. And sadly, plantation slaves had more pride than we do. Plantation slaves did not generally praise their masters for selling them off, for auctioning off the lives, hopes, dreams, and futures of their own little children. We can understand that cattle may lick the hand of the farmer who lowers an axe to its neck, because cattle are dumb beasts that cannot comprehend their real relationship with the farmer and his imminent plans for them. What is our excuse? When we chant, USA, 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 when we cheer and bow and beg and scrape and sing and weep with joy that some new farmer now presides over the wholesale dismantling and sale of our family's futures. When we love with obsessive emptiness the leaders who laugh while they auction us off to every tin pot dictator and stockbroker the world over, what is our excuse? Has our pride been so broken? that we lunge with pathetic joy at every new silver-tongued demagogue who pretends to care for us even a tiny little bit. In the future, our children will demand to know why we knelt and cheered as they were sold off on the auctioneer's block. This video, and my life's work, is my answer to my child. What's yours? So, Stefan hitting the nail on the head once again. Politicians see me as a cow. <laughs> Good for nothing but to produce the means for them to, to keep the party going. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Allie, do you have anything to add to that? It's, it's, it's very simple. Yeah, no, I, I like where he goes with that. It's, it's going to seem really dramatic and maybe a little melodramatic to, for people who maybe aren't already on board with the ideas, but as someone who has uh, accepted that the way that the government makes its money is wrong and the way that it treats people is wrong, it totally makes sense to me, at least, that uh, just to look at it sort of from a slave slave master perspective because i mean if you look at the if you really think about it as far as our relationship with our government goes what is it based upon why do we do all the things that it asks us to do is it in our good nature is it because we care we think that the government's good and that if we do what it says then it'll be best for everyone i mean why why do people do what the government says to do they do it because they're 
forced to do it. They're right. coerced into it. Right. They're afraid yeah. that if they don't, then something terrible will happen. And it's, you know, we have examples of terrible things happening to people that do go against what the government says. People, you know, our, uh, our other pundit, Michelle Seven, was thrown in jail for not getting licensing for a car. It's just... It's, it's insane. Something as mundane as that is something punishable by force. It's just crazy. Yep. And, you know, um, I think that's kind of a reason that's something I was thinking about this week. People don't want to think about government as a, as a coercive force that's stealing their money because then, then they... They really, feel like a victim. They, then, then they will have to do something about it. They'll have to get angry. Or some people to get will angry feel Or feel bad. Right. Yeah, or feel helpless, powerless, weak. I think that's a lot of people feel helpless after sort of realizing that, and then they, and then they feel like a slave, and they have a slave-like mentality. But uh, you know, if you most slave masters, you know, they'd have their plantation, and there'd maybe be I don't know how many people in their family, but then they'd have hundreds of slaves. Those hundreds of slaves, if they were if they weren't so afraid, then they could have easily freed themselves, mm -hmm. right? I mean, power in numbers. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's sort of one of the important ideas to share is that it, as long as everyone's afraid, the, the burden on people is not just from the state, but also from people around them, making them feel like they should support the government and they're afraid to let their fellow uh, citizens speak out against the government because it because it strikes fear in their heart that if if people start rebelling against the government then that'll mean bad things for all of us because they're afraid the axe is going to come down come down on all of us like we've seen with the protesters at the occupy events and you know they're not afraid to use force to get what they want and to suppress people yeah yeah um, you know I've wondered for so long like I like I said a couple of times tonight I just don't get why people um, why people don't feel just the way that I do, but it, it's because violence is incredibly powerful. And um, I think, I, I feel like I asked you before whether or not we were hitting a tipping point. And I think a critical minority, that's not exactly the term I'm looking for, but enough people are beginning to realize that nonviolent means are more powerful than violence. More, yeah. I sure hope so. I sure hope more people realize that. Let's go to Heike. Thank you for joining us tonight. As always, you can contact Freekeen TV by sending an email to tv at I'm Heike Corser saying good night and happy Thanksgiving, Keen.